Greetings from First United Methodist Church of Los Alamos, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. We have now resumed in-person worship with one service at 10 a.m., which is live streamed both on Facebook and on YouTube. We alternate each week between contemporary and traditional music. You may confirm worship times and receive more information by visiting our website, firstinyourheart.org. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our first scripture is from Daniel, who is one of the major prophets in the Hebrew Bible, major being on length, not necessarily importance. It does contain the familiar story of Daniel in the lion's den, but then turns to an apocalyptic vision, which is where today's passage begins. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed. Then he wrote down the dream. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then, as I watched, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a human being, and a, and a human mind was given to it. Another beast appeared, a second one that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three tusks in its mouth among its teeth, and was told, Arise, devour many bodies. After this, as I watched, another appeared like a leopard. The beast had four wings of a bird on its back and four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the visions by night a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking in pieces, and stamping what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that preceded it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns when another horn appeared, a little one coming up among them to make room for it. Three of the earlier horns were plucked up by the roots. There were eyes like human eyes in this horn and a mouth speaking arrogantly. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the noise of the arrogant words that the horn was speaking. As I watched, the beast was put to death, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. Our second scripture is from the 13th chapter, chapter of Revelation. John of Patmos has been conveying his vision, which contains a vision of a woman, sometimes interpreted as Mary, and sometimes as the church who gives birth to a child. She is pursued by a dragon who seeks to kill her and the child into heaven. Michael then battles the dragon and throws it down to the earth where it declares war on those who keep the commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus, which is where the passage picks up. 
And I saw a beast rising out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on its horns were ten diadems, and on its heads were blasphemous names. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And the dragon gave its power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have received a death blow, but its mortal wound had been healed. In amazement, the whole earth followed the beast. They worshipped the dragon, for he had been given his authority to the beast. He had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. It was given authority over every tribe, and people, and language, and nation, and all the inhabitants of the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that was slaughtered. Let anyone who has an ear listen. If you are to be taken captive, into captivity you go. If you kill with the sword, with the sword you must be killed. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It is my pleasure to welcome to the pulpit this morning Reverend Dr. Nancy Bowen. Reverend Dr. Bowen received a BA in physics before going on to earn her first her earn her master of divinity from Claremont School of Theology and then a PhD from Princeton Theological School after becoming one of the first women ordained in the United Methodist Church in New Mexico and serving several churches in New Mexico she became a professor of the Hebrew Bible at the Earlham School of Religion in Indiana before retiring a few years ago let us welcome Reverend Dr. Bowen to our pulpit this morning thank you you, you said most of the things I was going to say to introduce myself. <laughs> so yes, I was the sixth woman ordained elder in the New Mexico Annual Conference. If any of you are active in United Women of Faith, you may know my mother, Doris Bowen. Um, in the conference, it's like, oh, you're Nancy's mother. Oh, oh you're Doris's daughter. <laughs> so, um, so I grew up at St. John's in Albuquerque. Um, when I... First took Biblical Hebrew, having been a physics major, I thought, eh, I've solved differential equations worse than this. <laughs> How hard can it be? And yes, I taught um, Old Testament for 30 years with, at a Quaker seminary in Richmond, Indiana. So um, I learned a lot about being Quaker, and yet I did not become one. <laughs> but, um, they were, it was a great place to have a career and I'm glad I'm now retired. So I'm back in Albuquerque, um, where my family is, and, and live with my mother and our three cats. And I'm um, glad John asked me to come speak with you about apocalyptic literature. Now, keep in mind that when I did this in class, I would have at least an hour. <laughs> so this is going to be condensed and abbreviated. So in the Bible, the only true apocalyptic literature is Daniel 7 through 12 and the book of Revelation. And it's Revelation. There's no S on the end. It's singular, not plural. And if you say Revelations, I might haunt you in your dreams. <laughs> so it drives me crazy when I watch like supernatural shows on TV and they talk about the book of Revelations and it's like, if you can't even get that right. <laughs> so um, in the New Testament, you will also find um, some apocalyptic themes sort of woven throughout the New Testament. So even though there's only those two apocalyptic texts in the New Testament, 
It turns out apocalypses were a big deal in the years from about 200 BCE to 300 CE. So I have with me volume one of the Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. These are the books that were important but didn't make it into the canon. And in this volume, we have the Apocalypse of Abraham, the Apocalypse of Adam. It, um, let's see where else to go here. Second Baruch, third Baruch, fourth Baruch, the Apocalypse of Daniel, the Apocalypse of Elijah, everyone's favorite Apocalypse, first Enoch, um, the fourth book of Ezra, the Greek Apocalypse of Ezra, um, and this is just the, there's also New Testament pseudepigrapha that also has a number of apocalypses. So I would teach a class on Second Temple literature, the stuff that sort of came between Malachi and Matthew. And eventually my students are like, please don't make us read another apocalypse. <laughs> so it was in the air, so to speak around the time of Jesus. In fact, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, outside of the biblical books, they found the most copies, the most, apparently the most favorite books or scrolls other than the biblical texts was Jubilees and First Enoch. Who knew? So I want to give you three definitions of apocalyptic literature. A literary definition, a sociological definition, and a theological definition. So this is how you will know an apocalypse when you see one. So a literary definition. These are the component parts of apocalyptic literature. You don't have to have everyone to have an apocalypse, but you do need more than one. First, it's a message that's delivered by sight. The person has a vision or they hear a voice speaking to them, or sometimes it's both. There may be an otherworldly journey, such as through the various levels of heaven, like the third level of heaven and the seventh level of heaven. Um, you get this in First Enoch, for example, but it's not present in the biblical apocalypses. There is the presence of, a, of an otherworldly mediator usually an angelic figure who is named like Michael or Gabriel. And it's this person who delivers or explains the revelation or acts as the tour guide. So, so Daniel, so in one of the early stories in Daniel, the king has a dream, and the next morning he wakes up and he calls all of his advisors together and says, you need to interpret my dream for me. And they say, Tell us your dream, O oh Majesty, and we'll be glad to interpret it for you. And he's like, but I can't remember the dream. And his advice, <laughs> the king is like, well, what good are you? <laughs> and so Daniel comes along, and not only can he, he interpret the dream, he can tell the king the dream he had that the king can't remember. So Daniel is known as like, he is the wisest of the wise. Um, but like after the text that was just, Read in Daniel, we find Daniel sort of like scratching his head and thinking, um, yeah, I don't know nothing. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't understand any of this. And he has to approach one of the heavenly beings to have that heavenly being explain to him. So the guy that knew a dream the king can't remember now is totally perplexed by what he's seeing. Apocalyptic is characterized by bizarre visions, numerology, strange symbolism, and supernatural happenings. As we saw in both the texts, like you get a leopard that has wings and a beast that has horns and then more horns and they speak. And um, you get, so Daniel's told these wonders would last for a time, two times and a half. And, and in Revelation, it's the, the beast will have dominion for 42 months. And so if you're into apocalyptic literature, everyone is very concerned with what time it is. It usually includes, concludes with instructions for the recipient to stand fast or await the end. 
And finally, the content is concerned with the time of impending crisis. And history is rapidly moving toward this end time. That end will be judgment for some and salvation for others. I'm going to say more about that when I get to the theological piece. But so I want to consider for a brief moment the difference between prophetic texts and apocalyptic texts. So the three major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, all have their collections of short oracles. And there are oracles of judgment, and there are oracles of salvation, and there are oracles against foreign nations. Now, when you look at the minor prophets, sometimes you have all three of those, like in Amos. Sometimes, like in Hosea, you just have oracles of judgment and oracles of salvation. And then you have an oddity like Nahum, which is in its entirety an oracle against a foreign nation, Assyria. So when you read Daniel, is that what you have? No. You have stories of Daniel and his friends attached to an apocalypse. So we can blame the Greek version of the Bible for the fact that it tends to get interpreted as a or viewed as a prophetic text and Daniel as a prophet because in the Greek translation of the Bible, they stuck Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel together. In the Jewish order of the Bible, Daniel is in a total other section of the canon. And either to read a prophetic text as somehow apocalyptic or an, an apocalyptic text as somehow prophetic is, well, in my there was a, a book I used for classes at times that thought genre was everything, that like if you don't read the genre correctly, you are misreading it. And like, well, genre may not be everything, but there is a sense of that these books have a certain form to them and a certain way of doing things that we need to take seriously. Okay, so that's the literary definition. Sociological. Who are the people who wrote apocalyptic literature? Oh, so somebody said they had to look up the meaning of apocalyptic or apocalypse. Um, apocalypse, so it's the book of Revelation is the apocalypse of John. It's a Greek word that has a sense of to reveal something. So um, it's, which is why it gets then translated as revelation. So, so revelation is just the English translation of the Greek word apocalypse. So who are the people who wrote apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature? Think of it this way. Prophetic literature is in-house critique. Prophets critique their religious and political leaders for how they are the cause of suffering of their own people. Apocalyptic is us versus them. Them is some group of people out there who have power over us, who are persecuting us. Now, this is not, you're now also going to get a, you had a Greek lesson. Now you're going to get a history lesson. Alexander takes over the world in 333 BCE. When he dies, his empire is divided among his generals. The Ptolemies rule over Egypt, and the Seleucids rule Asia Minor and the area of the Holy Land. So around 167, the new Seleucid king is Antiochus IV Epiphanes. It's quite a name that rolls off the tongue. In order to consolidate his rule and empire, he demanded that everyone become Greek or die. He wanted uniformity in his kingdom. So um, that didn't go over well in, with the good folk in Jerusalem. And there was a revolt by a family known as the Maccabees that ended Greek rule over the Holy Land. It is that revolt that is the basis of the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. You didn't know that. And the book of 1 Maccabees, which is in the Apocrypha, which is not the Pseudepigrapha. <laughs> the Apocrypha, if you, and I forgot to look in the Pew Bible, they, they're the books that they put between Malachi and Matthew. Um, 
the point is to say is that scholars believe that Daniel's apocalypse was written in reaction to the persecution of Antiochus. In John's day, it was the persecution of the early Christians by Rome that prompted the writing. So during the rule of Antiochus, if you kept kosher, you die. If you circumcised your son, you die. If you keep the Sabbath, you die. To the people in Jerusalem, this was a world of chaos and disorder. So one way to think of the wild and crazy beasts in apocalyptic literature is that the disordered nature of the beast reflects the disordered nature of the world. So there's a <clears throat> really great book that's really technical because I think it was a dissertation um, called Apocalypse Against Empire. Apocalypses are resistance literature, which brings me to the theological definition. How many of you have seen Star Wars movies? Congratulations, you now have the basic theology of apocalyptic literature. <laughs> it, really, it really is apocalyptic. Um, so apocalyptic developed a radically new view of history. The prophets want to reform history. Yes, there are problems, but when God restores the world after the judgment, the new world is the same world that we have just vastly improved. Apocalypses, on the other hand, have no interest in reforming history because it can't be reformed. The present time is locked in the grip of dark forces. Think of the empire in Star Wars. At some point, God will come in and destroy those forces and begin a new world order where evil is destroyed and the faithful live in glory. Current history, bad, evil, which will end, done, beneath. New history is God's reign. There will be a completely new history and new creation. The good news is that God is in control of all of this. When it looks like total chaos and destruction and the world is doomed, Part of the theology is that the world is under God's control, not human control. Theologically, the way apocalyptic resists empire is to say that there is a force, if you will, <laughs> or power that is greater than the power of any human tyrant. And because of God's greater power, those, that evil empire will eventually be destroyed. I want to add two other theological bits. One, in the dominant theology of the Bible, if you suffer, it is because you broke the covenant. Suffering is a result of your own actions. Therefore, you have to repent in order to end the suffering and to be restored to God's blessing. An apocalyptic takes that and turns it upside down and inside out. Because an apocalyptic, your suffering is not because you did something wrong, your suffering is because you do something right. So in that sense, your suffering is undeserved. You're not being held accountable for bad behavior. Instead, you suffer because you are being persecuted for remaining faithful, which under Antiochus meant keeping kosher, circumcising your son, and keeping Sabbath. Under Rome, it meant worshiping and being obedient to Christ as the son of God and not the Roman emperor. Two, the dominant theology of the Bible is that God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. Now, most of the Old Testament has no view of a life after death. And so the idea that God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked was in this life. And we have books like Ecclesiastes that come along and say, eh, not so much. <laughs> but one of the things apocalyptic theology does is it develops... It develops a theology of life after death. Why? So we can continue to believe that God is righteous, rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked, and isn't just sort of randomly throwing out, you know, rewards and punishments willy-nilly for no good reason that we can discern. Under persecution, people die. So why remain faithful? Why not eat pork if that will keep you alive? 
because you will eventually be rewarded at some future time after death. This is where the Bible also begins to develop the concept of resurrection. By remaining faithful to your beliefs, you will be rewarded in the new world, the new creation. Which may explain why the stories of Daniel and his friends are attached to the apocalypse. To consider what remaining faithful looks like, look to Daniel and his friends, especially the stories of the fiery furnace and the lion's den. This is the theology of martyrdom that was so central in early Christianity under Roman persecution. The stories of the martyrs are all about how they remained faithful even unto death. So I have a note to myself, time to wrap up. <laughs> Apocalyptic tends to develop when people experience the ability to live out their faith being squeezed down to zero. Where I have sympathy for apocalyptic literature is the feeling that if we could just blow up the Death Star, then there would be a bright new world for all. But I also have some objections to apocalyptic literature. One is the dualism, us, them, good, evil, God, empire, righteous, wicked, as though we can easily discern who is righteous and who is wicked, who is part of the empire and who isn't. It's tricky knowing who is righteous and who is wicked. My other objection is that it's, in, even though I've had students and there have been other scholars who have tried to argue otherwise, it is literature, resistance literature, it is nonviolent. And yet violence is the whole goal of apocalyptic literature because the goal is to annihilate all of them. Only when all of them are destroyed will there be God's reign. Yay, have we just admitted to wanting to commit to genocide? Because we want to have all of them destroyed? That one makes me twitch. So even though apocalyptic is a very small piece of the Bible, why does it continue to be so central for so many Christians? Perhaps because in the last 2,000 plus years, when have we not lived in apocalyptic times? <laughs> Where the world seems gripped by evil forces beyond our control and it looks like we're doomed. And we ask how long, O Lord, and we look to that power that is greater than any human power to bring evil to an end. So um, I'm going to do two brief readings. Um, so this is the apocalypse of Abraham. And um, Abraham is speaking to God, saying, like, I don't understand. And God says, I will explain to you the things you desired in your heart that you have sought to know the ten plagues which I prepared against the heathen, and I prepared them beforehand in the passing of the twelve hours on earth. Here's what I will tell you. It will be this. The first, sorrow from much need. The second, fiery conflagrations for the cities. The third, destruction by pestilence among the cattle. The fourth, famine of the world of their generation. The fifth, among the rulers, destruction by earthquake and the sword. The sixth, increase of hail and snow. The seventh, wild beasts will be their grave. The eighth, pestilence and hunger will change their destruction. The ninth, execution by the sword and flight and distress. The tenth, thunder voices and destroying earthquakes. You can find almost all of those in the daily news. <laughs> Every apocalyptic writer thought at the time of their writing that the end was near. Because I'm old, I read Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth in the 1970s, and he was sure the end was near. And since then, almost every week, there is somebody who will tell you they are sure the end is near. And um, yet the world keeps on spinning, and humans continue to be awful to each other. So 
rather than trying to predict when the world will end, um, other than eight million years from now when the sun finally engulfs the earth, um, here's what I find helpful for me. Maybe this will be helpful for you. When I hear apocalyptic warnings, or I hear people interpreting that the end is near, I find myself, I want to ponder then the nature of empire. Who feels like their ability to live out the world is being squeezed to zero? What do they find that they are unable to live out their faith? And then to ask, is that something our, my, that I or my community contributes to? So I don't have an answer to human nature. <laughs> and, and mostly I'm distressed that it seems like we always live in apocalyptic times. And if I have a vision for the fu future, is that maybe is there some way we can get to a future where nobody needs to write an apocalypse? So. There you go. Um, Nancy's take on apocalyptic literature. <laughs> and um, I'm happy to hang around for a while after. If you have any questions, happy to answer those. And thanks for listening. Let us pray. Just briefly. God, open our eyes to see how you are at work in this world. In destruction and in restoration in life and in death. We pray to you, the one who is beyond life and death, and who is our God, the Alpha and Omega. Amen. Now Thank you for watching, and don't forget to follow our YouTube channel and Twitter, and like us on Facebook if you haven't already. And remember that every action you take today could change someone's life. So make sure it's a good one, and be an agent of love. God bless.